Okay, are we are you ready to get going? Yeah, Chris, for better, make it a pause and we can okay. start. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for deciding to, to come to this talk. My name is Christopher Beatty. I work at Lightbends, which is a company which contributes a lot to open source. Uh, one of those projects is Akka, and it's my full-time job basically to, to work on Akka. I've been doing that for about six months or so. Before that, I was mainly freelancing in London and building systems with, with libraries and technologies like Akka. So that's where most of my experience is, is with. And today, I want to talk about some techniques which I learned a lot before joining Lightbend for building responsive and scalable services by using two techniques. Uh, one is to use an asynchronous execution model, and the other is to use back pressure and flow control to make sure that having gone asynchronous, you don't end up killing your downstream dependencies, bringing too much stuff into mem memory, etc. So I would like to get an idea of, of, of you guys and who's, who's in the audience. So is there anyone in the audience who's used Akka? Oh, quite a few, more than, more than I expected. Or another asynchronous library like Rx Java or things like that? Yep, cool. That was slightly more than I expected. But there's still plenty of people who, who haven't used Akka, so I'll, I'll just briefly have a, an overview of that first. So. It's a set of libraries. Uh, I wouldn't classify it as a framework because it doesn't decide what your main method looks like or how you structure any of your code. At, at the core of it is um, an alternative concurrency model. So rather than using threads and semaphores and locks, et cetera, uh, you deal with something called an, an actor, which you can think of as a class, but rather than calling synchronous methods on it, you send, meth you send messages asynchronously. And you don't actually deal with things like threads, et cetera. The ACA scheduler, the ACA runtime, it, it handles that. And it's got a couple of benefits. So one, you don't need to worry about mutual exclusion. Your actor only gets to receive one message at a time. And you don't need to worry about data visibility. So it puts the appropriate happens before relationships, et cetera. So it, it's a useful concurrency model. It also works pretty well over the network. So rather than taking a synchronous local programming model and turning it into a remote RPC framework, uh, which can have problems due to the abstractions and the latency involved, taking an actor model and making it distributed is, is, is more realistic and straightforward because you're message passing and you deal with the, um, the at most one semantics. So we've got some clustering software, but I'm not really going to talk about that today. We also have a persistence API. It's, a, it's not like Spring Data. It's not a, a general persistence uh, framework. It's specifically if you want to do event sourcing or, or CQRS. The two things I will spend most of this presentation on are going to be our HTTP engine. So we have a full from scratch uh, HTTP library and Akka Streams, which are a reactive streams compliant uh, library for doing asynchronous uh, message pro data processing. So first goal of the presentation is to define what it means for an application to be responsive and how being asynchronous and using flow control can help. So I'd say there are two types of responsiveness. So the, f the first one is pretty trivial. So if a request comes into your application, it's can you respond within a certain amount of time not real-time systems, but you know, pretty deterministically deciding whether you're going to be able to be successful in that request or whether you might fail. And in the age of distributed systems and microservices and deploying multiple instances of your application, I'd argue that being down is, is, is probably better or failing is better than being slow because it just appears as if you hang and, it, and it's, it's bad for your clients. The other slightly more interesting thing about calling your application responsive is can you remain responsive under heavy load? So if you capacity plan your system and you think that with the hardware that you've been given, you can handle 1,000 concurrent requests, what does your application do if you get 1,001 requests? What, does it, what happens if you get a spike in traffic and you get 2,000 requests into an instance? And I think applications tend to fall into two categories. And I think one is good and one is not so good. Uh, the first category is your system grinds to a halt. All of the clients lose, get, don't get good responses. Things queue up in memory. And eventually, you'll end up with something like an out of memory error, or the GC will go crazy. The better response, I think, is that even though you're under a load, you're under 2,000 requests rather than you thought that the system could handle 1,000. What I'd like to do is to say you should maintain 1,000 transactions, 1,000 concurrent users, and somehow work shed the others, drop them. 
Because I don't know about the systems you build, but the ones I built before drawing Lightband, if we had a big football game, I worked for the main television provider in the UK for quite a long time. If Manchester United are playing CSK Moscow, that was actually one of our biggest traffic days. And if we have, we have to refund people if they don't watch the match. So we'd much rather two thirds of it work and a third didn't than the whole thing grinding to a halt. Another way of thinking this, and it's not just, say, concurrent requests, but the amount of memory that you've capacity planned your application for. So let's say that you've decided, OK, my containers or my VMs or my, my hosts, they're going to have four gigabytes of RAM, and maybe I give two gigabytes to the heap. What happens when you get an unexpected request come into your application, and it's pulling something from a queuing system or perhaps a database, and it's a bit unbounded? Maybe it's the events for a user, what they've done. What happens if you end up bringing too much into memory? Or maybe what happens if, or, or better, I would say, if that does happen, being able to decide what rate those, that comes back from your database or your queuing system and tying it up to the rate at which you can write it on the other side, the, other t the TCP socket on the other side. So that's responsiveness, and we're going to talk about that. The other characteristic that I, I, like, I like is, is scalability. And again, I'd say scalability falls into two categories, and we're primarily going to talk about the first one. So it's about single node scalability. How can you be resource efficient so that given the hardware that you've got, how many concurrent requests, how much work can you do? Uh, there's also multi-node scalability. So how do I scale my application across many hosts? I'd, I'd be happy to talk about that after in the discussion session, but I'm not going to talk about that too much in the, in, in the, in the, pres in the presentation. Now, Reliability, so responsiveness and scalability, I would say, are abstract traits. And now I want to talk about techniques. So not technology yet, but just general programming techniques that we do to, to achieve those two things. And one technique which you can use for scalability is to use an asynchronous execution model. So rather than use a thread per request, we're going to do everything asynchronously. So if we need to go to the database, we don't block a thread, or we need to go to over a HTTP endpoint or an RPC framework. Rather than blocking a thread that, say, the HTTP library or, say, Tomcat or something has given us, we'll use some programming technique so that we can forget about that th request, use the thread for something else, another request coming in, and then somehow set some callback up so we resume that request when the database or the queuing system or the, the HTTP, the other service, gets back to us. And there are a whole host of those. A lot of you have used Akka, but Java 8 has the completable future, which we use in our HTTP APIs extensi extensively now. Scala Futures, um, just a quick question. Who here, who here does Java full time? Most Scala? Some Kotlin? About the same? Cool, right. So we're going to have a look mainly at completable futures today and Akka streams, but I'll also show a few Scala futures. Uh, they'll be very similar to the completable future you used to in the JDK. We're not going to spend much time looking at actors, because actors suffer from the problem which I'm going to talk about, which is how do you decide, how do you do your flow control throughout your application? We're mainly going to look at ACA streams. And then that's your programming model, but that doesn't mean that you're asynchronous all the way through. Just using completable futures or Scala futures or um, tasks, that doesn't mean you're scalable. It doesn't mean that you can make the same number of resources, the same amount of RAM, um, be able to handle more and more requests. So for that, we need to do everything asynchronously. So we need to do our HTTP calls and our interacting with systems like Kafka, et cetera. And some of these libraries won't allow you to do that. Some will. Um, and some of them have thread pools inside. Even when they offer an asynchronous framework on the front end, a non-blocking API, sometimes they're still using a thread per request under the covers. So we just need to be, to be aware of that. And an important point to note is asynchronous execution model, we're not trying to reduce latency. We're trying to increase scalability. So they're quite different. Actually, the overhead of having completable features and every time you do a flat map, submitting something new to an executor, try not a flat map, a then compose in completable features. Uh, every time you do that, it involves a new submission to an execution context under the, under the covers. Uh, it could actually be slower. The latency could be higher. But it's about not wasting resources on requests that don't actually need compute effort. They don't actually need threads, because we're just waiting for a database to come back or a queuing system. A big problem with asynchronous systems that I've experienced a lot, and I imagine you have if you've tried to move to asynchronous systems, is suddenly, with synchronous systems where you have a thread per request, one of the limiting factors is the number of operating system threads you can have at any given time. 
Maybe you've configured a, a, a Tomcat or a WebLogic or something to have 1,000 request threads. So once you've hit 1,001, you do get some implied back pressure. It's not the same that we're going to talk about now, but it does limit you. If you're suddenly you're composing everything asynchronously, what stops you from accepting an unlimited number of requests? What is the new bottleneck? And it's very easy to either, when you're asynchronously programming, to accidentally completely overload a different part of your application or completely overload your database or your, another service that you're sending messages to. Because with a small number of threads, say the same number as you've got calls on your machine, if a lot of those requests are doing I.O. and you're doing it asynchronously, there's nothing stopping you from a medium-sized Linux box doing thousands and thousands of concurrent requests. So what we're going to talk about is flow control, and I'll use that term interchangeably. So with back pressure, they're the same terms, I just, I just flip between the two. And the key takeaway, so that's everything I want to cover. So hopefully by the end of this, you're going to get a good idea if you don't do things asynchronously, what type of problems will it, will it suit? Why then do we need flow control? And what is the reactive stream specification? So as part of JDK 9, it, the, the APIs for the reactive stream specification were actually included. And AccuStreams is one of the implementations. So what is that? And how can I use AccuStreams with, say, RxJava? And then the end, so probably about 45 minutes of talk and 15 minutes of demonstration, I want to I do everything that I've just said. So I want to show you the difference between having an asynchronous system and how many concurrent requests. So we'll do a little load test just on my laptop, which is going to be running far too many things. And then I want to demonstrate flow control. And reactive streams and ACA streams are all about flow control within a single JVM, a single process. And TCP has built-in flow control mechanisms for between processes. So I want to demonstrate that all the way through. So we're going to have a HTTP client calling into a service. That service is then going to talk to a database. I'm going to use a local Apache Cassandra. And if the HTTP client is overloaded or it decides to slow down, I want everything to slow down. So I don't want to pull things from the database into the HTTP server if the client isn't reading them quickly enough from the other side of the socket. So that we can demonstrate flow control. And we'll, we'll, look at some, we'll use Wireshark to look at the network in between two and things. So the use case during the demo and code snippets I'll show over the next uh, 20 minutes or so is quite simple. Two different endpoints, and they do quite different things with different characteristics. So the first is about getting a small bit of information, a small bit of data. It's finite. It might be no more than like 10 kilobytes, just some user information from a database over the network using HTTP. Now, that is the endpoint which we'll use to demonstrate the benefit of an asynchronous, of using an asynchronous execution model. Because really, there's no compute there. Um, all we're really doing is waiting for responses. So that's where you get the, the, the most benefit from programming this way. And then we're going to do the, the one which is an unbounded response. So maybe five megabytes comes back from the database, maybe two gigabytes does. And I've preloaded a little Cassandra instance on my laptop, which has many gigabytes of data, for what, which will come back in one, one request. And it's these typical use cases you have where, OK, I want to track what my customers are doing. Um, most customers do 12 events, or they log on once a day. And then you've got the one crazy customer that decides to log on, log off, do all sorts of things. And you end up with far more data for that customer than, than all of the other ones. And that's the one we'll show the, the flow control all the, way, all the way through. And a couple of requirements. Based on the title of the talk, we want to respond, even if it's a failure. So I'd rather have a 503 after a given amount of time than to wait indefinitely when my database is slow. And the other two I've touched on, but maybe not explicitly, I don't want to do unnecessary work. So if the client slows down, we don't want to keep hitting the database. And I want to do it with a constant memory footprint, regardless of the size of the payload that we eventually end up sending to the, to, to the client. And when I do the demonstration, we're going to do it with a small number of threads, and we're going to do it with a 128 megabyte or a 256 megabyte heap, even though the responses are going to be very, very large. So on to actual examples and actual code. So we're going to start talking about execution models and, and, and how they differ. And throughout the talk and all of my examples, they can all be simplified to one client talking to one server. That might be over something like TCP. It might be 
messages that go via a queue inside your process. And we're going to really think about what threads are involved and how does the client decide at what rate that it sends requests to the server. They might be request response. It might be just an asynchronous send, fire and forget. And we really want to think about what happens in the server, so what happens in the yellow diagram here, what threads are used. But we also want to take it all the way to the client. We don't want to just return from a method and say, we've, we've brought the memory into object, and something else will serialize it. We want to, we want to see it all the way through. So the, the first example is how I'm guessing a lot, a lot of Java code looks like which is a, a traditional synchronous programming model, where you assign a, an individual thread, which in Java is an operating system thread, to each thing that you do, to each request. So if you're using something like Tomcat or Jetty, then they'll provide this, and it'll call into your servlet or some abstraction on top of the servlet. And that's where you're, pretty mu you're modeling your system as a, you know, a method invocation, a synchronous method invocation. So of course, in this example here, which is very simplified, if I want to perform a task, that's fine. But what happens if I want to perform a group of tasks for an individual request? Well, they'll happen serially, one after, one after another, even if one of those tasks is not really doing anything, not really using any CPU. It's just waiting for responses for things. Now, you could solve this. You don't need something like Acker or some fancy library to solve this. You could solve this with executors and you know, queues, thread pools, no problem. But that's really going quite low level, and you have to worry about a, a lot of edge cases. And Actor, for those who haven't seen them, is kind of different. You, in, the, in the Java API, you, you build up this uh, match, you build up this uh, receive builder. And what it essentially does is it associates things, classes, messages that you send to it, in this example, a task, with some work to do. The, it looks pretty much like a method call. It looks like the other one. But the difference is, when you send this message, so the code below, which calls actor.tell, that's asynchronous. That puts it in what's called a mailbox, which you can think of as a bit like a queue. And then our scheduler, which will be sized based on the number of calls on the box, will decide how to schedule those messages going to those actors. And if you want to do something like a blocking database call or a, a HTTP call, you would hope you'd, 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 you'd try to do that in an asynchronous manner, and you can schedule another message to come back to the actor when it's done, and then you can, you, can, you can carry on. And there are ways, if you can't avoid a blocking call, to use a different thread pool, like an IO thread pool, uh, if your actor really does need to block. But of course, this is just one way to do things asynchronously. We're going to look at futures very soon. So the next thing I want to look at is something a bit more concrete, so a web request, a HTTP request. I'm guessing a lot of people here use Spring and JEE and all kind of things which basically map a, a, a HTTP request into a synchronous method invocation. And it's very natural, I think, to, to think of a request, a web request, as a function from HTTP request to HTTP response. And if everything you want to do in your web request is CPU bound, I think this is a really good model. When this isn't a good model is when you need to talk to databases, talk to queuing systems, send other messages, things which don't really require CPU time. So a lot of the aforementioned web frameworks, they've decided to change this. And many of them will be a future, which we'll just see in a second. But we want to worry about this example. So when these things take a long time and we don't need a CPU for it. And a lot of these things are very hard to time out and be responsive deterministically. Who here makes a call out over HTTP synchronously and thinks it deterministically times out in, say, 500 milliseconds? It's, it's really quite hard, because most things like HTTP clients, you can set socket level timeouts on them. You can, say, set the connection timeout. You can set the TCP receive timeout. But what that is, it's a timeout which is it's a network timeout. So, just because you're receiving a bit of data every 500 milliseconds, because that's what you've set the timeout to, your whole response might be spread over many, many packets. So this might take, take even longer. So a way around that is to not represent your request as a, a synchronous method call, but instead to represent it as a function from HTT request to some asynchronous abstraction. And in this example, it's a completable future. So, there is nothing stopping you with completed full futures, which were added in Java 8, to do lots and lots of exciting blocking things inside the callbacks, inside your, you know, your then composes and your, your then applies. But it does give you the option not to do that. 
You know, you can, assuming you're dealing with an async database, an async you know, HTTP client, what you can do is you can set up this chain of things. And now, what you're returning to your web server, to Spring, to Akka, to whichever thing you're using, is not the whole request, but a recipe for the request, which it can then execute and then put a call back on and then send the data back whenever it's ready. And this works really well for small responses. It's exactly how we're going to do the first requirement of a user getting some user stuff from, it, from a database. What I think futures are really bad at, though, is when you've got large responses. Because it's very easy to accidentally bring all of the response, regardless of how big it is, into the object inside the completable future. That's not to say you do do that. It could be some type of stream, which we're going to look at ACA streams for that example. But we don't want to, for a request, bring an unbounded amount of data into something like a future. So one kind of caveat, as soon as you go into this style of programming, everything needs to be asynchronous, right? So in this example here, a very simple synchronous code is suddenly using these funky methods like then compose and then apply. So the things like looking up a user, that needs to return a completable feature. If we go and make a request to an external service, that needs to return a completable feature or, or something of, of equal power. And I'm not really going to cover the actual APIs of completable feature much today, but essentially, then compose allows you to, when an asynchronous computation is finished, I would like to take the result, even though I don't have it yet, and do another asynchronous computation without using up a thread in the meantime. And then apply is quite similar, but it's, you're, you're, you're tacking on a not asynchronous uh, method call. So it, we don't need to do any network call or anything to map the response to a HTTP response at the end. So this is some aqual HTTP code. This is probably a good time to note that th this presentation, all of the codes, um, it is from the demo. So it's not copied and pasted. It's not just something I've typed in PowerPoint. There's a, I've got a little thing which pulls the code from an actual project and puts it into HTML slides. So we're going to go through the, re the real code, the actual code inside an IDE uh, later on. So here, imagine our database could um, go, to, go, the, go to a database, get a user. The user might exist, so I decided to represent this one as an, a completable future to represent the fact it is asynchronous. And then the optional to say, we might get a user, we might not. And then for Aka HTTP, you can call on success, pass it a future, and then a function which will map that future and turn it into something HTTPE, if that's a real word, at the end. So we can either serialize the response or we can say, no, sorry, it's a complete status code not found. So here's the same example with a bit more, but in Scala. So I've included the, um, the API mapping, so the equivalent of like your app path annotations in like JaxRS. So we're saying user slash name, this would be. And the reason I showed this one is when you deal with things like futures rather than synchronous method calls, it's relatively straightforward to compose two futures to say, Actually, I want the first one that completes out of this one and this one. So it's very easy for Aka HTTP to say to, to slap on a timeout, and it basically is going to race another future with your future. And whichever completes first will get the response. And we'll probably see that when we end up load testing it on my laptop. So either we'll get a 503 from Aka HTTP because there's a request timeout, or we'll get the actual response from my, my local Cassandra. This is just a full example of dealing with the Cassandra API. Not very exciting. We'll probably look at it in a bit more detail when we do the demo. But they use uh, Guava's listenable futures. So I've just got a, a helper function there to turn it into a completable future. I then just do some mapping, and it's not too exciting. Right. So that's about being responsive. And just to recap a little bit, there's two reasons we wanted to, to move to what seems like a different and more complex programming model of using things like completable futures. And it was to allow us to use fewer threads so that we could be more resource efficient, so we could run more concurrent requests within our, our, our JVM. And it's one way that you can put deter more deterministic timeouts on, because you're not blocking a thread which might be stuck in some library. You know, all the, the, our, the web framework Aka HTTP is doing, or Jetty, is waiting for a future to complete. And it, it could give up waiting for that future quite easily. However, we've definitely produced ourselves a new problem. If you're using Jetty or Tomcat or something like that, and you're not using, say, the async serverlet API, you are mapping a request to a thread. And things like Jetty and Tomcat, they have thread pools with a, with a fixed size. And maybe if you're using, when I use Drop Wizard with Jetty, I think the, the default was 1,024 request threads, 
which means that you can only handle 1,000 concurrent requests, right? You can increase that if you've got more memory, that's fine. But that gave you actually a big benefit because you suddenly have now limited, I can actually only make 1,000 concurrent requests. So if I'm calling out to another external service or another database, you can't really call it more than 1,000 times unless you're kicking off other threads, et cetera. Yet if we're going asynchronous, that, that method call which returned a completable feature, assuming you're not doing any blocking in there, that will return within a few milliseconds. So how many concurrent requests can we have into our service now? I don't know. As it could be nearly an unbounded number, and we'll probably hit a new bottleneck, which could be TCP sockets on the, on the box. It could be memory. It could be CPU, because you've got so many of these things outgoing. And even though only a little bit of CPU is used each time, it, it adds up. So most of the time, when, when, we, when we move from synchronous to asynchronous systems, you end up with the problem where you either overload part of your application, or you kill one of your dependencies, or you kill your database, and bad things happen. So, the other part of the talk is going to be on how to, how to prevent that. And it's all about playing fair. And we want to talk about how to do things proactively rather than reactively, which is ironic because it's called the Reactive Streams API. But we don't want to react to us killing our database. We want to proactively send the right number of requests so we can, we can utilize our database very well or another component in our system, but we don't want to overload it. And it's just asking the simple question, how many requests can a client send to a server? How many messages can you send to a topic on, say, Kafka? Uh, let's say you've got like two bits of Java code and you've got a queue in between. How many messages should you put in? What happens when, when the queue is full? I've worked on a lot of systems, and I've done 10 years of Java programming before moving to, to Scala. And the default is some messages start to come in, and that's good. But eventually, you eventually overwhelm. And a lot of Java executors and things, the default queue in front of them is unbounded. So it's very, very easy in these style of systems to completely overload a part, bring far too many concurrent requests in, in, into the application, and either run out of memory or have a DBA shout at you or take out another, uh, take out another service. So this is what we want to try and avoid next. The first option could be just to put Kafka in between everything. But that obviously doesn't work if it's two parts of your process. And also, you cannot put Kafka in between your database and your program. You could try. But the thing about Kafka is it gives you the illusion of an unbounded buffer. Who here has filled up their Kafka cluster? Oh, we've got a couple, so we've taken down Kafka. So it's, it's obviously not infallible. But the good thing about that is it allows us to buffer. But if we're doing anything in memory, in reality, there is a possibility we could fill up Kafka. Or we're doing a tran transient request. We're making a, a request over TCP over, say, HTTP or some other RPC framework. We don't have that persistent buffer. So we need to decide at what rate we send things from A to B. And if a publisher is doing really well, and don't just think of PubSub, think of a publisher as anything. It could be HTTP requests coming into your application. It could, could be anything. And a really popular thing, I'm not sure how many people have looked at the, uh, the, um, the Netflix Hystrix library, is to use something called a circuit breaker. So a circuit breaker is where on any async boundary or any bit of code or any call to an external system which, might, which you think is, is risky or you might think might, might fail, you wrap it in something and it keeps track of how many requests you've made, how many have failed, how many have timed out. And if it starts to time out, and either, or if it starts to fail, then it cuts it off. And it says, OK, we've obviously hurt your colleague's service or your database or another part of your application. We're going to stop doing that. And that is what I mean about avoiding being reactive when it comes to this. Because what we've done there is we've taken them down, and then we've been like, OK, try and come back up. That's nice. But what we want to do is actually decide at what rate we should send the requests before actually taking them down. That's where flow control comes in. So what we want to do is dynamically adjust rate. And in, depending on the context, this will be different. This could be HTTP requests, messages to a queue, whatever. We want the publisher and the a protocol between publishers and subscribers to agree on the rate at which it's sent. But you don't want to hard code this. You want, you want this to be dynamic. And most problems in this space can be abstracted so any consumer of data or requests, it has some buffer. And it can buffer up so many requests. 
And what Reactive Streams do, and what TCP does, is it advertises the free space. And as you consume elements, it re-advertises the space. So the request is sent from the consumer to the publisher. And it's not like it's now the consumer calling the publisher. It's, a, it's, a, it's just part of the protocol. So it's, it might say, I've got space for 20 more requests, or 10. So if the consumer is keeping up, the publisher gets to go as fast as it likes. But if the consumer starts to fall behind, then the publisher has to stop. And there's some really interesting examples about how you can do this. So imagine you had a very simple service, HTTP in, out to a database queuing system. What happens if the rate at which you accept connections is not based on a thread pool, but, uh, but is based on how many concurrent connections you've got to the database, or how your database or your queuing system is behaving. And if your database starts to slow down or, do, or stop requests or start to fail, that is propagated back. So you actually stop accepting connections, and which might then propagate to your load balancer and final, finally to your client. And this works really well over TCP. Um, what Reactive Streams is, which is a specification and a set of rules and a set of interfaces in, in Java, which have made it into, into JDK 9, is bringing something very similar to TCP flow control into your application. And it is especially for asynchronous systems, because if it's a thread per request, you kind of get this natural, I'm going to allow 1,000 concurrent requests. It might be fixed. It might be hard coded. It's not very dynamic. But when you're asynchronous, we really need to, to, to work on this. So if you remember what an actor looks like, I'm telling you actors are a good way of designing a system by asynchronous message passing. But how on earth do I decide how many messages to send to an actor without filling up its mailbox? And surprise, surprise, there's a lot of common patterns that people have built into systems building with ACA. And it's normally like you have to acknowledge. And obviously, an ACK per message is quite expensive. So you decide to ACK every so often. Then you know, no, nope, need to do it the other way around. I need to say, actually, I'm ready to be sent 10 messages. Lots of similar patterns. Reactive streams and ACA streams specifically builds on top of actors so that you don't need to do any of that. It all just happens under the covers. It's been around a while. So it was originally people from, from my team before I joined, Rx Java and Twitter. Um, it is the specification was formalized, and then it finally made it into JDK 9. It doesn't mean you can't use it if you're not using JDK 9. It has started its life off as a library. Um, and one of the, the benefits of something being Reactive Streams compliant is, first, it makes sure that that component behaves well. But it also allows component A and component B, even if they were built with different libraries, to talk to each other. So it really is a specification that's for library designers. And any time you want to like, connect, say, Acker Streams to a database driver or Acker Streams to Rx Java. If you have a look in the latest uh, JDK and you look into javautilconcurrent.flow, it's there. But if you're dealing with Acker Streams, you never actually programmed this interface. This is, these are the things which are used under the covers to propagate, to propagate the demand. So I'm now going to have a quick fly through kind of Acker Streams 101. And then we're going to put it all together, and we're going to use ACA streams with ACA HTTP to demonstrate the flow control from HTTP client through server into our database. So the concepts you need, only a few to start off with, but then there are more things on top of it. You need to understand what a source, a flow, and a sync is. A source is a source of data. So a source might represent a topic in Kafka. It might represent a table in Cassandra. It could represent some unfold computation. It could be anything. A sync is on the other side. So a sync could represent, again, most of the same things, because but this time you're, you're putting messages in the topic or in the table. So that's what syncs are where data ends up. Anything in between is either a graph or a flow. We're only going to look at flows today. So they have inputs and outputs. There's some really simple flows, like map, which takes it wait, type A and turns it into type B. But then there can be some really complex flows. A flow could be an outbound HTTP request, which then takes in a request, sends it out, and then sends a response back through the ACA stream. And the important thing to note, something you don't need to worry about when you program, but is happening under the covers, is upstream components, so like a source and a flow in this example, are not allowed to send things downstream until downstream has said, yep, I've got some capacity. 
So in this very simple example, whatever our source is, it's not allowed to get rows from the database, apart from if it's doing some buffering as an optimization, until demand has come up from the sync. Probably the simplest source would be some of the built-in ones for playing around with Akka streams. So you could have a source which represents the numbers from 0 to 20 million. And that's not going to manifest itself as a collection of 20 million elements in memory. What it really is is a recipe for producing elements. A flow can be really simple. Here's one which just turns a function into a flow, which turns an object into a string. And again, a sync, which normally means you're leaving the process, you're going somewhere like a database or queuing system. But it can be either a side affecting function, like with for each, or you can actually fold over. Here's the types for these. So sources, flows, and sinks. Sources and sinks have two type parameters. Uh, one of the type parameters is what you might expect. It is the type of the elements a source can produce or the type of elements that a sink consumes. There's an extra type parameter on all of these, which is what's called a materialized value. So when you use Akka Streams, you build your pipeline, and it's your data processing pipeline, which then runs, and you, don't, you just leave it alone. What that can do is materialize values that you can use to interact with it. So you might, in this example here, the for each one materializes a completion stage, which is a subset of the completable future, which means that you can, you can, it'll, that future will complete when the stream is finished. But these are just recipes, and that's kind of important for performance optimizations down the lines. So you can create reusable components with Akka Streams, and then you can connect them together. So you can say, oh, here's a source. I want to go via this flow, so the elements will flow through the flow, flow through the flow, and then go to the sink. But that doesn't do anything yet. There's nothing happened. This is a recipe. And then you use an actor system to actually run the thing. And it gets turned into actors under the covers with all of this flow control built in but you don't have to worry too much about that. Just to show you that the APIs look pretty similar, this is the exact same program, but with the Scala API. Uh, you're going to get var in, in, in Java soon, aren't we? So it's going to look even more similar um, as of Java 10. Again, you can connect it all together, and then you can run it. And the Scala API uses a few things called implicits, which we're definitely not going to go into today. So the materialization process is kind of interesting, and it helps a lot with performance when related to uh, like just future-based, uh, completable future and Scala future-based APIs. So because building the pipeline is different from running the pipeline, we get to choose how to turn that Akka stream into something real, like threads and et cetera, but it will be actors. So if we were to have this, so a source which ranges from one to three, we map it a couple of times, and then we end up going to a sync which folds over, which reduces it. So that's going to add up all of the elements. How could that be materialized? It could be all synchronous in a thread. It's actually as actors. And by, by default, everything will be fused together. So if you take a future, many futures and you do a map, you're pretty much guaranteeing that that's going to be another runnable sent to a thread pool, which happens when the previous stage completes. Whereas in here, we'll just squash all this into one. That has the, the side effect or the downside that only one element can go through the stream at a time because it's all one actor, and actors, you only send one message at a time. So you can add your own asynchronous boundaries. So you can say, actually, I know you want to squash those, or fuse them, is the term we use, into one thing, but I want to process elements in parallel as they're going through this stream. So putting this async thing, we don't see it, the difference is a small async thing on the, on the second line. What that'll do is it'll be materialized as two actors. So now, when element one gets to the second part, past the asynchronous boundary, another element can be processed up in, in, in the first part of the stream. And it's at those asynchronous boundaries where the flow control happens. So if we're just fusing everything to an actor, we don't need to worry about flow control. It's just a synchronous execution. But as soon as we're dealing with that async boundary, that's where Akka is doing all of the flow control, the type of things that people used to build into actor-based systems. And that's also the place at which you can turn an Akka source, an Akka syncs, into reactive streams, uh, publishers, and subscribers, and connect them up to another library. So you don't need to build your system all with one library. I can't imagine many people are going to use multiple of these stream processing libraries, but this is going to come to play a lot in future versions of Java when the built-in JDK HTTP client 
could be Reactive Streams compliant, and the, the async JDBC driver could be Reactive Streams compliant. It means we're just going to be able to glue these things together, and it's going to work nicely. But all of that is inside a single process. So same JVM, act as running. So then we need to tie into how TCP works. And when we're dealing with raw TCP or HTTP, we need to make sure we turn TCP's flow control into ACA streams and reactive streams um, by, uh, flow control. So quick kind of, I'm guessing a lot of people will know this, but a quick like, overview of how TCP flow control works is it's bi-directional. So we've got more buffers. You know, client can send to server, server can send to client. There's a buffer on both sides. So you have a send buffer and a receive buffer. And you're not allowed to send data over a TCP socket until the other side has advertised its window, its buffer size. So you can never, over, you can never overload it. And as our application, so the green server in this example, as it, if it doesn't consume elements from that buffer, say it starts to fill up, the window is re-advertised to be smaller. One problem we face though when we build applications is we often don't pay attention to this. We, we keep sending data to a socket and it's not, uh, even though it's not accepting it. Or we bring too much into memory from the socket or, like, or too much from memory from a database before we can actually send it to a socket on the other side because they're very, very disconnected. When we do the demo, I'm going to show this. Don't worry about seeing what's on Wireshark right now. I'll, I'll zoom in when we're doing it. But we're going to see this happen. We're going to see the TCP windows fill up, and we're going to see TCP halt. Then we're going to kick our application to speed up, and then it's going to all unflow, and we're going to start sending data between our components again. So just to make sure I haven't lost you there, we need to deal with flow control within an application, within a process. And that's to make sure one part of our application, say our HTTP requests coming in doesn't overload, say, our database. And then we want to translate that to make sure it propagates over, over TCP. So it's about time we put it all together. So my plan is to, we are great. I've got about just under 20 minutes left. So we'll have a quick look at what we're going to design and build in slides. And then we'll just go into the IDE. So if you miss any bits of code that I show you and you don't understand the code, we're going to spend more time on it inside the IDE. So, so don't worry about it. My goal is not to have you leave this presentation and be completely familiar with the ACA HTTP and ACA Streams API. That's something you have to spend quite some time on. What we want to see is the, the benefits of using an API with flow control built in. So we're going to use an ACA HTTP client, ACA HTTP server, and we're going to use something called Alpaca. So Alpaca is a library of ACA Streams connectors built by a little bit by my team, but primarily by the community, users of ACA Streams who say, OK, I want to build a source or a sync for my favorite database or for my favorite queuing system. And they understand, obviously, that system way more than we do. So they know how to translate flow control from, say, a Cassandra database or a RabbitMQ better than people who write Scala all day. So the big example is in Scala, but I, it's very, very similar in Java. I can show you both when we get into, a bit into the IDE. So an ACA HTTP client, it is a bit different to, to ones you may, you may have used before. So the first bit is just a single request. We're sending it off. Nothing exciting there. The bit I want to highlight, and we'll spend a bit more time on inside the IDE, is the fact that when we get the response, it's a future. So when we get the headers back from a, a HTTP request, that future will complete. But that does not mean that we've got all of the data off the socket and brought it into memory. So when you, when you handle the future completing, you get back a source. So on the third line in the second code snippet, we've got a source of byte strings. Now, there are marshalling and unmarshalling libraries, so you don't need to worry too much about bytes when you're using it. But I wanted to show you with, with, with byte strings. Now, if you remember, a source is not allowed to produce elements until we get demand from downstream. So until you connect something to that source and read the bytes, then we're not actually going to take them off the TCP socket, which means that the server and uh, that the server and the client, their TCP buffers, their send buffer and their receive buffer, they're going to fill up, and then the server is going to stop. And if you're doing something reactive streamsy on the server side, hopefully that translates all the way back to say the say the database. So until we attach that source and start reading from that source, nothing's going to happen. And that's what we're going to do. We've got a little command line application, which can basically I type in what demand, how much, how much should we read, how many bytes should we read from that source. An ACA server. So 
binding to a port, not very interesting. You get a future back to say, oh, that would be a completable future if that was Java, to say, hey, we're bounded, we're good to go. What's quite interesting is we showed a route before, which was you know, that get DSL, we'll show it again inside the IDE. That is a DSL, but it really all, ju it all just turns down to an ACA flow from HTTP requests to HTTP responses. The server side. So it's a source again. So imagine you've got a database client, so my data access object here, which returns a source, not a future, an actual source. And remember again, we don't, that source doesn't produce data. It doesn't start until you start to read from it. So if that source is, say, connected to your database or your queuing system, what ACA streams will do, or what ACA HTTP server will do, is it will connect the other side of that source to the TCP socket for the client coming in. So until the client reads the data, we're not going to pull from that source, which means assuming that our source for our database is working correctly, we're not going to pull rows from the database. If that doesn't make sense, we're going to demonstrate it. Uh, the Cassandra source is part of Alpaca. I'm not really going to go into the implementation of that, but you can build your own sources. There's an API for, for doing that. But essentially, it turns a Cassandra query into a source, and the rows will be pulled back asynchronously as and when the demand propagates down. So we're going to go into demoing it now. And I'm going to change my screen so it's mirrored, so I can see what on earth I'm doing. So I'm hoping that's going to work. Keep. Looks good. I will, I'm going to use a zoom thing like this. So anytime I think something's important, I can zoom in, and hopefully everyone can see, just in case you're thinking that's, that's far too small. So I'm going to go into IntelliJ. How are we looking at that? That's definitely big enough. So what I mentioned before while doing the presentation was that all of the code, let me get rid of that, we don't want to see that. All of the code is pulled out, so ignore these comments with hashes in. That's what my, the, the build tool uses to pull out bits of code and, and stick them in slides. So I'm going to start with the asynchronous thing first. So what I want to do is start up an ACA HTTP server. It's going to talk to my local Cassandra, which I filled full of, filled full of data. And I want to be able to, with a small heap, small number of threads, have many hundreds of concurrent requests. Before we do that, let's have a little look at the code. So this is how we bind to a port, nice and simple. Again, this is, I'll show you, this is Scala. So uh, this is a main method, all of this. This is equivalent to a main method. So the root. The root is a bunch of roots all connected together. The one we're, we're only going to care about one at the moment, which is this one. So this is the one we saw in the slides. And it goes to slash user, slash name. We've got this request timeout, and depending on how the demo gods go, it's either, if, if that does trigger because my local Cassandra is being slow, then we'd get a 503. Otherwise, we'll get a success. The lookup for a user is just a future. This is a small response. We don't mind bringing this one into memory. And if it's, we don't find the user, which is not going to happen because we're going to get me out of the database, then we do not found. Otherwise, we complete with the user. Otherwise, it's an internal server error. Maybe Cassandra blew up. Who knows? So we're not going to use the HTTP client first. We're just going to hit this with a load test tool. And the load is called upload. Who here does capacity planning and load testing of their services? Anyone? No? It's production. Anyway, so I used JMeter for a lot, long time. I, I now use Gatlin. So this is for doing full service load testing. It's not like something like JMH for doing micro benchmarking or just doing code. This is, this is the load test tool for doing things like HTTP requests or requests to a database. And one thing I really like about it, A, what does a load test tool do? It makes a request and it records a response and the timing, et cetera. So nearly everything it does is asynchronous. So one of the benefits of Gatlin is it is asynchronous, whereas if I want to get my JMeter to do three or 400,000 requests a second, it requires a very big box or lots of boxes working together. So what does it look like? So this is a scenario. And it's nice because you can check these in, et cetera. But this isn't a talk on Gatlin. So I'm just going to go to slash user slash chbt. And I'm, the DSL for it is basically going to allow me to say, can you see the bottom OK? Looks OK, but I'll bring it up a bit. It's going to inject 400 users per second. So we're expecting 400 TPS from this. And they're going to be new, new users making a new request. And we're going to run that. Um, so let's start the server application. Uh, one other thing we're going to do is we're going to connect flight record, sorry, just mission control, and we're going to keep track of which threads are there, and we're going to see how much like, native memory is used for threads and things. 
So let's start that. So I'm going to start my server application. This is where it doesn't work. Yep, so it's bound. Nothing exciting so far. The JVM process is running now, so I can go and connect in. Hopefully. Right, that's far too small, so I'm going to use my Zoom. So memory on the bottom here, which is, oh no, go over there. It doesn't work at this resolution. It's, that failed. OK, so you'll have to trust me that this line here maps up to 26 megabytes of memory. All right, so we're not using much memory. When I did the run application, I should show you this. I've set the heap to be pretty small. Let's just double check what I set it to. So I set it to 256, and I enabled native memory tracking. We can go to the threads. So we've got a bunch of threads here. We've got some RMI ones. The only ones we really care about are these ones. So we've got Akka's I.O. threads, and we've got the actual request, thre the actual request threads. And let me do my zoom. So there we go. We've got two threads here just at the, just at the bottom. I'm just going to. There we go. So I've just done. I've just put a, a query in there, so it's only going to show me show me the ACA threads. So let's run this now. So not that we want to run the load test tool. Let's compile that, and I've got a script. So I run this from the command line. So I'll just show you the script. It's nothing. My Russian visa. <laughs> that took a long time. <laughs> this is what I want. Um, so run Gatlin. Nothing exciting there. So I'm running Gatling. I'm setting the class path, um, Gatling's start script, and then I'm just telling it which scenario to run, which is that. So I'm going to run Gatling. Let that go. It's going to print some summaries as it goes along. We'll make sure it starts before I go and look at things. So some failed. That's good. That's what I wanted. So we've got some 503s because some of the initial requests timed out because we put that thing around. This is going to generate us a nice, pretty report, but it'll print out some things in the meantime. So thousands of requests are currently happening. We're up to seven failures and 5,000 requests. If we jump back to this one, which I'll zoom in again, I've configured ACA to only use up to eight threads. I have eight cores on, on, on this machine. So it's not going to create any more threads than that. If I look at the heap size, the memory, it's, I'll zoom in again. You can see it's spiking. So it's spiking between 72 megabytes and 20, 20 megabytes. What else? We can do diagnostic commands. We can go and have a look at the native memory. We can go and see how much it's using for threads. We can zoom in. It's a very awkward shortcut to do my zoom. So we can see we've got 51 threads total, even though there's, there's all sorts of other threads running in the application. Cassandra has a few network threads. The equivalent of the Java fork join pool in, in, in Scala has, has a few. But we've, we've only got eight. We're only using a small amount of resources for that. And it's finished. Didn't run for very long. I'm just going to open that up. If you've not used Gatlin, it can awe you with its prettiness. So we've made. 23,000 successful requests or requests under a certain time. We were going at 400 requests a second, even though we only had eight threads, which is kind of the, the benefit. Uh, this is just running on my laptop. It also has the load test tool, also has Cassandra. So when you're running on, obviously, a beefy Linux box, you can, you can scale this up. So the next thing I want to demonstrate, and we've got just under 10 minutes, is the flow control. I actually think that's a lot more interesting. So. For me to demonstrate flow control, I need to be able to control the rate at which something consumes something, right? If I just let it go, it's just going to go quickly, and it's going to be the most boring demo in the world. But if I, what I've done is I've got this client driver. So this is a HTTP request. So it's a future of source. So future completes when the HTTP request has, start, is, has completed, and we've got HTTP headers. The source represents the data. So if we look at the implementation, it's from the slides. It takes it into byte strings. It does some parsing, but that's not really important. Now, what we've got here is a test sync. So to test Aku streams, we provided a test utility which gives you syncs and syncs so that you can say request six elements. You know, so you can actually recreate the scenarios that happen in your production systems. I'm going to use that to drive this application so I can change the speed at which it runs. So what I'm going to do is this is the HTTP request, the activity. When the future is complete, so that means the HTTP headers are back, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the source. The source represents the actual data that's coming over the socket. And I'm going to attach it to my test sync. And then I have control over the sync. How do I control the sync? Well, it's a very fancy application. It reads a line from standard input. And then it tries to request that many elements in a loop. 
So I'm going to type it. I'm just going to type things in. So I'm going to bring this up. The HTTP app's already running. I'm going to open Wireshark as well. I'm going to have a look on loopback, and I don't want whatever Dropbox or anything's up to. So I'm just going to say TCP. Did I start the client? Let's do client driver. Let's just restart that. Chuka 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 chuka. TCP point. Bear with me one second. Why is I haven't left a load test tool running. Yeah, the client was running. Close that saving. So nothing's happening yet. I'm also going to just, just so I don't go crazy, I'm going to just open. This is a server socket. This is a socket statistics. So that just there's no TCP. This will show me if there's a TCP connection um, between the client and the port. And because the client and the server is running on the same host, we're going to see both sides of the TCP connection here once we've started. So I'm going to start the I'm going to start the client driver. It's going to go, and it's failed because connection is refused. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to start the the server because I forgot I stopped it. Server is now running. Client is now running. There we go. Doesn't do anything. Right. So what's happened so far? So you'd think nothing should happen because we haven't typed anything in. That's what I'd initially think. But what has actually happened is we've sent a bunch of data. So I'll zoom in just in case you're too interested. But this is showing the TCP handshake, the, the SYN, SYN, ACK, ACK. Then it's pushing data. And the reason for that is we're able to do some amount of work until we fill up the TCP buffers, the sends buffer on the, on the server side and the receive buffer on the client side. But once they fill up, then TCP stops. And ACA HTTP, or more specifically ACA TCP, it then stops the flow control. It stops giving demand. So if we actually scroll down here, what's happened between the client and the server, if we go down quite a bit, really, what the hell are you doing? What is this? Is this red stuff here, which is is basically saying Wireshark, which is sniffing the network traffic, is saying that the TCP window is full. Right? So everything has stopped. And one thing I've done in the server application is I've got these printouts, which hopefully you can see, which is when we're pulling data from Cassandra. So because the Cassandra data, database driver is asynchronous, you actually tell it when it should prefetch. So every time it thinks it should pull data from Cassandra, it makes this log. And if I were to just press Enter a few times, it's not happening anymore. It's just one TCP connection. There's no, it's not multiple requests here. It's one request that's ground to a halt because we're not reading the bytes off the socket on the client side. This here, which is um, socket statistics, this is showing us to say there's a, we're seeing the TCP connection from both sides. So here's it from the, the server to the client and the client to the server. These are how big the buffers are. And it's not getting any bigger or smaller. So we've, we've just halted. So what happens if we then give some demand? So the, the data is bringing back from the database is not very interesting. It's events for me, the customer. And my events are things like I eat some crisps, I go to the shop, I buy some crisps, I eat. It's just the same thing repeated over and over again. And I can ask for a 1,000 of these. What happens when I request this? Well, the demand from the HTTP client then reads from the, the receive side TCP buffer, which then should then allow the server to send some more, which will allow Acker streams on the other side to pull more data, which will end up at the Cassandra source, which will pull more data from Cassandra. So hopefully, if I go back to Wireshark, we've got some more data sent. So we've basically gone non-red. But because I only pulled out a small amount the first time, oh, Wireshark's having a problem. I pulled out only a small amount of data. We've then gone right back into this red, this black and red section, which is the TCP window, which is full again. Did it require us? And if we go back to the HTTP client, if you remember, I pressed Enter a bunch of times, so it was what it was yellow, yellowish white space. We've started querying Cassandra again because the client has read some sockets. So we've gone from HTTP client over TCP, HTTP server over TCP to Cassandra, and it all run and stop. And remember, this is still the same application running with quite a small heap. I restarted it, so I need to reconnect again. But we're still running with a small heap, even though it was if, if I actually pulled the whole thing from Cassandra, it'd be many hundreds of megabytes if not gigabytes. OK, so that is all I have time for the demo, I think. I've got about 30 seconds left. So just the summary, the asynchronous thing is low resources, lots of concurrent requests. 
The flow control demo is as soon as one part slowed down, that propagates all the way to whatever external systems, whatever databases you're using. And that allows you to not waste resources. It allows us to have many concurrent requests because we're not wasting time doing things for requests that have, say, slowed down because whoever's calling us has decided to fall over in a heap or, or slow down. So on that note, I just want to say thank you very much. Uh, the resources, all the slides are on GitHub there, including the code and instructions on how to recreate any of the demos. If you want to ping either my team or me on Twitter, feel free. I'm not very good at responding. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>